Good afternoon, if you are in the East Coast, uh, like uh, pretty much all of our panel, our chair, our speaker, and our discussant. And good morning, if you are in the West Coast, like me, and good evening, if you are joining us uh, from Turkey, uh, or the region, larger region over there, maybe Armenia, maybe the Balkans, maybe the Arab world. My name is Baki. Baki Tezjan. I teach history at the University of California in Davis, um, and we are using UC Davis uh, technical support uh, Zoom uh, facilities. That's why I have UC Davis right over my head there, the Go Aggies. Um, I'm also the, the convener of uh, the online meetings of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association, and that's why we are here today. Um, let me just share with you uh, for a second, my screen, there is not much uh, in my PowerPoint this morning, other than uh, the poster for the talk you're here for, the Armenians of Aintab, the economics of genocide in an Ottoman province, um, by uh, my colleague, Umit Kurt, who will be with you in a second. Uh, as you know, his book received an honorary mention in last year's OTSA Book Prize competition, and we are bringing all of the recipients of awards of OTSA to WhatsApp meetings. So Umit is going to tell us about his book uh, in a little bit. And before that, though, I want to introduce to you uh, the chair of the panel, uh, Professor Janet Klein from the University of Akron. Um, I know Janet for a very, very long time. Um, and uh, she, I guess uh, she, it wouldn't be wrong to call her one of the uh, foremost uh, leaders of Kurdish studies, uh, Ottoman Kurdish Ottoman studies in United States, uh, when she had started working on uh, Kurdish Ottoman history, uh, there were not a whole lot of people doing it. There were there were some people, of course, who had done it before, but not a whole lot in North America. And I personally witnessed the kind of difficulties she had to suffer in uh, Turkey at the archives. Uh, you all know about her book. Uh, which you can see right there in the Turkish translations, uh, the, the Turkish translation of it. She's also the associate editor of the Journal of Kurdish Studies, which unfortunately has experienced a hostile takeover. If you uh, are watching the Age Turk uh, news about that, and I, I really hope uh, it will get back in order. It's a very, very sad story to hear. All right, I'm not going to take more time. Janet, please take over. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Baki. Yes, Baki is one of my dearest uh, and oldest, let's age ourselves, colleagues and friends. Um, so uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited um, because uh, I've read Umit Kurt's book. It's wonderful. And I've always admired um, uh, Ron Suni's work. So it's great to be here with both of them today. Um, Dr. Umit Kurt is a historian of the modern Middle East. His research is on the social, cultural, and economic history of, late, of the late Ottoman Empire and early Turkish Republic in the 19th and 20th centuries, with a special focus on the Armenian genocide and dispossession of Ottoman Armenians at large, imperial interest, ethnic politics, forced migration, and infrastructural transformations. He completed his dissertation in the Department of History at Clark University in 2016, and he has uh, since then held several postdoctoral positions at prestigious institutions. Currently, Dr. Kurt is an associate professor in the School of Humanities, Creative Industry, and Social Sciences in the History Division in the University of Newcastle in Australia. He has been serving as a Vice Executive Secretary for the International Network of Genocide Scholars from March 2020 to today. His recent book, which we will be discussing today, uh, The Armenians of Aintab, The Economics of Genocide in an Ottoman Province, has been the recipient of several awards and honorary mentions, and he has also published widely in edited volumes and top journals. Dr. Kurt is the winner of the Discovery Early Career Researcher Award in 2020. This is an award that's given by the Australian Research Council, and he's a fellow member of the Royal Historical Society. Um, and 
uh, Dr. Ron, Ronald Grigor Suni, who probably needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway, is William H. Sewell Jr., Distinguished University Professor of History and Professor of Political Science Emeritus at the University of Michigan and Emeritus Professor of Political Science and History at the University of Chicago. He was the first holder of the Alex Manukian Chair in Modern Armenian History at the University of Michigan, where he founded and directed the Armenian Studies Program. He's the author of many books, The Baku Commune, Class and Nationality in the Russian Revolution, The Making of Geor the Georgian Nation, Looking Toward Ararat, Armenia and Modern History, the Revenge of the Past, Nationalism, Revolution, and the Collapse of the Soviet Union, The Soviet Experiment, Russia, the Soviet Union, and the Successor States, They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, A History of the Armenian Genocide, and Red Flag Unfurled, uh, History, Historians, and the Russian Revolution, Red Flag Wounded, Stalinism and the Fate of the Soviet Experiment, Stalin, uh, Passage to Revolution, and co-author with Valerie Kivelson of Russia's Empires. Professor Sunni is currently work working on a book on the history of the nation form and the recent upsurge of exclusivist nationalisms and authoritarian populisms called Forging the Nation, the Making and Faking of Nationalisms, which I have to say I'm super looking forward to. <laughs> so thank you uh, all for being here in whatever time zone you're in. And we're going to hear from you meet first. Um, Dr. Kurt will t tell us about his book. And then um, Dr. Suni will uh, offer some comments and then we'll open the floor up to questions from, um, from all of you. If you have uh, questions, if for whatever reason you, um, don't want to ask your question on camera live, uh, you can put it in the chat where we will, um, I will read it out loud for the recording. And I turn it over to you, you meet. Thank you, my dear Janet. <clears throat> Hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for all of you for being with us. And I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Ottoman and Turkey Studies Association and 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 Baki Bey, Professor Tezcan, for organizing this important event and also for the for this uh, significant uh, award uh, for my book. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Suni and and Professor Klein to be with me uh, on this occasion. So <clears throat> I'm going to keep my presentation as brief and concise as possible and giving you some glimpses, also bullet points about the book and the gist of it, hopefully, if I can. So the, the, this book is, is, is basically the story of uh, Aintab Armenians, the city of Aintab where I was born and raised, and still my immediate and extended family members are living in the town, in the city. And <clears throat> the story of Aintab Armenians who were torn away from their homes, neighborhoods, and the city where they were born and raised. And this is the account of how their material and spatial wealth changed hence and uh, was transformed. And, and also this is the historical record of their persecution and the subsequent uh, erosion. So the book basically offers a fresh take uh, at an analyzing the murder and the plunder of the Armenians of Aintab. Uh, it portrays the socioeconomic and political undercurrents which reinforce the foundations of a genocide in the making. It provides a historical analysis of the local dynamics while paying attention to the political, ideological, social, and economic climate in Aintab, a crucially important town and the district of the time located in south southern eastern Anatolia, also referred as Cilicia. So the book examines the role played by local notables and provincial elites who prosper into new wealthy social stratum through systematic acquisition of Armenian property and wealth. By combining socio-political and socio-economic historical methods, the book treats Aintab as a microcosm to elucidate the confiscation and the transfer of our main properties. It shows that this process is an essential component of a genocidal policy and demonstrates how the prospect of material improvement serve as a, as a major incentive uh, for garnering the support and involvement of the Muslim gentry in the Armenian genocide. So, 
to me, it convincingly shows the Armenian genocide and its redistribution of wealth to local Turkish and other Muslim groups uh, help, quote unquote, nationalize the economy and help create new local elites. Given, given that these local elites are still, at least partially, existing today, uh, that's why the book is bound to provoke debate as well in that sense. So <clears throat> I see my book uh, more than a case study or more than just a case study. It does not merely add further detail to what is already known or substantiate a pattern with which we are familiar, give or take some regional variation. It uses specificities to reflect on and reshape our knowledge of the wider whole. It does not just look at the local dynamics of genocide and community reformation, but also considers the evolving mutually informing relationship of the metropolitan power center to its regional periphery, thereby revealing a very significant locus of agency amongst regional elites. So the book's inclusion of micro level examination of expropriation and plunder at the local level uh, resonates with, with, with exploring the beneficiaries of Aryanization in the case of Holocaust as well, as well as its economic and material spillover effects in the Holocaust too. I can make such an analogy at least. So also it's the first time in this book, a report of property liquidation commission is discovered and methodologically analyzed. To date, that kind of report has never been explored in the field of Armenian genocide studies and also in the field of late Ottoman studies as well. So <clears throat> most studies of the Armenian genocide in the existing state of art or and, and more generally of violence in Anatolia, let's say, miss the local dimension and focus on grand politics and machinizations within the Committee of Union and Progress Party, the Ottoman ruling elite at the time of the time. So this book has the potential to change thoroughly the way we understand this incident and to provide new insights on local agency and the role of local societies in the perpetration of this atrocity. So the book also brings back the notion of class which has experienced an eclipse in recent years in genocide studies. It shows that the economic and political ideological interest of the perpetrators, the gentry, different sectors of urban population and ordinary Muslims and so forth, did overlap in the process of our main persecution. And that intersection of these, these two interests determined the momentum and intensity of the violence. In this regard, the case of Ayintab suggests that Turkish Republic cannot be fully grasped without taking into consideration the concept of class. So uh, in a way, this is a study of the Armenian genocide, uh, but also uh, the biography of a city in a time of trouble and violence. So balancing these two perspectives is, is, seems so difficult and perilous actually, but the fact that the book kind of uh, could manage to achieve it most, most of the time uh, uh, as well. So uh, the manuscript highlights the that, that the local actors in Aintab were not simply engaged in implementing or opposing orders from the center. They rather functioned as pivotal actors and agents that was present throughout the whole process. So. This carefully needed story on Aintab unveils the similarities between the massacres of 1895 under the reign of Abdul Hamid II and the death of 1915, particularly in terms of how massacre became a means of plunder and appropriation. So a more disturbing revelation is that the events of 1915 and 16 provided the foundation for the establishment of a new regime starting in the early 20s. So the rising elite of the newly established regime gain power and legitimacy through cleansing of the Armenian community and spoliation its property. So this, their um, tacit partnership, I would say, in crime highlights the economic motives prevalent in almost three decades of violence faced by minorities around the turn of the century. So the Ottoman district of Aintab in that sense exemplifies how the negotiation between local and central authorities shaped the making of the Armenian genocide. So in the manuscript, I argue that the CUP's decisions in favor of deportation and genocide had a certain level of social support, 
which it had achieved through the practice of effective power and control mechanisms at the local level. Therefore, the role of local agents and provincial elites here deserves closer examination. CUP rely to a considerable extent on the cooperation of local administration and elites, political institutions, and ordinary people in Aintab. So in this sense, my work highlights how the CUP and their local collaborators were able to mobilize local community and how this process was facilitated through appropriation and redistribution of Armenian properties. So that's why Armenian genocide as Professor Sunni has always high, uh, pointed out in, in his uh, uh, noteworthy studies. It was much more complicated than the outcome of a simple top-down decision-making process in which the CUP leadership assigned, enforced, and oversaw extermination as policies, while mo local Muslims acted as passive, indifferent bystanders. My work asserts that the relationship between the central power and regional or local authorities was not only one-directional, and hierarchical. Instead, I show the, that regional offices and the central authority have mutually influenced one another or each other. And of course, the prospect of personal enrichment serve effectively to implicate and integrate the local collaborators within the process of destruction and looting. Um, so the book provides a kind of new analysis on both levels, the state and the local community, but looking at them together. And I consider this work to be an integral addition to the late Ottoman and early Republican scholarship for two reasons. First, it addresses key questions of the period. Second, it does so by offering a radical shift in approaching these questions. The most striking aspect of this shift has to do with the focus on one particular area, namely that of Aintab in southern eastern Anatolia. For understandable reasons, much of the previous work done on the genocide concentrated on micro understanding of the nature of the events, with a particular emphasis on the central governmental policies devised and implemented by the CUP. Local accounts, however, was used only to illustrate the implementation of these policies at the ground level, by presenting cases collected from a variety of provincial locations. So my book reveals the differences and discrepancies between the assumed impact of unionist policies on the Armenian populated areas and the actual dynamics of implementation of mass murder, genocide, breakdown of social fabric and the spoliation in those areas. So <clears throat> the result is fascinating, but also terrifying, harrowing for sure, as this demonstrates that local elites and Muslims in the, in the community at large benefited from the implementation of genocidal policies. There was, in other words, an explicit desire at the local level for the plunder of assets and property of the Armenian community, rather than the generally assumed ideological pressure emanating from the political center. So another argument of the book is its recount of the famous battle of Aintab against the French, which resulted on Tep Savunması in Turkish historiography, Aintabi Koyamarde or Heresomarde in Armenian historiography, which resulted in the gifting of the honorific prefix Gazi, as in Gaziantep. The battle is narrated not as a heroic act of patriotism, but an organized struggle of a group of genocide profiters seeking to hold on to their loot. This is how I describe the whole war, whole battle. The afterlife of the murder and the theft of World War I figures, so importantly, because my work realizes much more clearly than many genocide scholars that the genocide is for the perpetrating polity a creative as much as a destructive endeavor. So in addition to eradicating the Armenian community, deportation was also a means of guiding the Muslim population towards a new identity. Along with rewarding individual perpetrators, plunder was also a way of integrating, quote unquote, reliable, resourcing muhajirs to the nascent Turkish Muslim bourgeoisie as a driver of national modernization in a Darwinian world of struggle, as Donald Bloxham has argued. So post-Lozan contortions of Turkish law ensured that the Christians 
who had been deported in 1915 and 16 or fled later with the departing French forces could neither retain title to lost property nor demand compensation for it. Thus, was the Republican regime linked to its Ittihadi's predecessor via persecutory economic policy as well as personnel, rank and file, and ideology. So uh, I want to finish with, uh, with, with, with the, uh, Michael uh, Prowan's also uh, remarks on the book as he underlines it's a richly sourced exploration of expulsion and destruction of the Armenian community of Aintab and enduring family fortunes were built on the state sanction ex expulsion and theft of assets. A story that could and also should be told about other post-Ottoman peoples and lands. That's why uh, I, I see my book as an exemplary late Ottoman social history of a prosperous, but also deeply traumatized provincial town and probably uh, 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 another another uh, book uh, publish, not another book publish about uh, Aintab. Let's say so. I'm gonna stop here, and I'll be delighted to hear uh, Professor Suni's remarks and the Q and A sessions for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Umit. Um, it certainly is an important book, and now we get to hear from Professor Suni um, on his remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janet, for hosting this and your ki kind remarks and your introduction. And thank you, Umit, for writing the book, because it's a stunning book and it's a courageous book. And it has wonderful connections to your own life and your own experience as well. So I was very touched by the story that Umit tells early in the book that as a young man, he accidentally learned that a beautiful neighborhood in his hometown had been built and lived in by wealthy Armenians, who, a current householder remarked vaguely, had left. I guess, you know, Gitmish Ler or something like that. I remember once being in Erzurum at the museum for the uh, Erzurum Congress of Kemalists. And the head of that museum also said to me that the Armenians, I said, what happened to them? A quarter of the population. And she said, they left. So uh, Umit was intrigued and he set out on his own scholarly investigation. And what he discovered, as he explained, was a largely unknown history of a thriving community that had been forcibly dispossessed of its property and had either indeed left or been massacred. His decision to concentrate on a single city during and after the Armenian genocide of 1915 offers a powerful lens into the intricacies on the local level of how genocides are carried out, which at one and the same time illuminate motivations for and effects of genocidal violence and the role of ordinary people and elites, notables, against their neighbors. And his chosen angle of vision focuses on what he calls the economy of plunder. Uh, and this particularly vicious <coughs> primitive accumulation of capital by a new Turkish bourgeoisie, which produced the bourgeoisie of the present day Turkey. Indeed, people like Harry Hartunian have also used this metaphor of Marx's primitive accumulation of capital. And this is, by the way, probably the most primitive accumulation. Kill everyone and take everything. What was occurring, he writes, was a legal operation of theft. The use of the legal system was both an attempt to deny and legitimate, legitimate the Armenian genocide under the cover of legality. The law was used to provide a legitimation of what was in fact an act of power and destruction, unquote. Looking back from what we know happened, it's easy to spot the sources of ethnic and social conflict between the relatively affluent Armenians of Aintap 
who made up much of the middle classes of the city and dominated trade and industry and agriculture, and the local Muslims, many of them much poorer, less well-educated, and feeling marginalized in their own empire. Armenians were a minority, of course. They were discriminated against in many ways, and yet they appeared in the eyes of resentful Turks and Kurds to be socially superior. Armenians' Christianity gave them a certain communal solidarity. It forged connections to the outside world and the patronage of, Arme of American missionaries who set up schools for fellows of the faith, all of which fostered a sense of national identity and ambitions. With this toxic mix of ethnic and social distinctions, and here I'm quoting again, envy and resentment opened the door to a hate-mongering atmosphere, as was clear to anyone reading the Ottoman press. For four days in November 1895, Muslims attacked and killed some three to 400 Armenians in Aintap, ransacking shops and houses. When that violence stopped, it was the Armenians who were arrested. I quote from Umit's book, no Muslims were punished in the wake of the massacres, and the authorities systematically portrayed Christians as the aggressors, a perspective occasionally represented in Turkish historiography even today." Unquote. Now, compared to other towns and regions of the Ottoman Empire, relations between Muslims and Armenians seem to have been comparatively peaceful in Aintab. But the self-proclaimed constitutionalist revolution of the Committee of Union and Progress, CUP, in 1908, and its promise of equality between Muslims and non-Muslims, quote, further exacerbated feelings of resentment toward the Armenians of the city, unquote. Note how carefully Umit uses ideas and the language of emotions, envy, resentment, uh, to describe the creation of what I've called in my book, They Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, an affective disposition, a worldview that began to construct Armenians as an existential threat to the Muslims of the empire. Due to the efforts of local young Turk leaders in the city, Aintap avoided the kind of pogrom that had devastated Adana in April 1909, and later, uh, in 1915, the deportations of Armenian Aintepsis began rather late, only in August 1915, half a year after they had been launched in other places. And then, for months, local Armenians watched as convoys of destitute Armenian deportees from the north were driven through the city on their way to the deserts of Syria. The architect of the genocide, Talat Pasha, replaced the moderate governor of the city. And in the late summer, the deportations commenced. Those marched under guard from their homes were robbed, many murdered, and whoever reached the desert then faced starvation. Muslim refugees were quickly moved into their abandoned homes in an effort to change the demography of Eastern and Southern uh, Anatolia. And the profile of this once multicultural city was homogenized into a religiously Muslim, ethnically Turkish and Kurdish one. The movable goods of the deported Armenians were sold off and their houses and shops and schools were confiscated and distributed to Muslims, predominantly to refugees and immigrants. Churches were turned into stables or barracks, and Umit shows in exhaustive de detail, much of it taken from Armenian sources. Note that Umit knows the language of the victims. This is a really important new trend in Ottoman studies that is decolonizing the history of the empire and dealing with their own sources of the non-Muslim peoples. The deportation and genocide of Aintap Armenians 
this is a very important point that Umit makes, was not implemented by a rabble brought in from the countryside to carry out an act recognized as too despicable for respectable people. Nor was it performed by Eintop's more ordinary have-nots, but rather were brought together by the district's notables, landowners, dignitaries, and the city's elites." Unquote. Oh yeah, the orders had come from Istanbul, but locals eagerly carried out the physical elimination of the Armenian presence in Eintop. I have in my review, much of what, what I'm quoting from in Turkish studies, um, had one criticism, but I realize I'm looking at the book again, it's a very minor criticism. Because it seemed to me on the initial reading that uh, Umit had narrowed motivation to economic self-interest, to uh, rational actors who wanted to enrich themselves. But in fact, there's plenty of evidence when you look at the book that there was also shared ideology, emotional constructions of Armenians and others acting by, uh, acted on by the local elites and ordinary Muslims. Yes, there was the uh, base desire to plunder the assets and property of the Armenian community. Yet much of Umid's evidence and narrative actually suggests that that interest, that rational dispossession, was understood through affective constructions of who the Armenians were, their, their illegitimacy to have these advantages, the resentments that had been felt, and what threats to Muslim well-being the Armenians presented. While calculations of economic self-interest are certainly present, people in Anatolia at the time were not simply liberal uh, uh, homo econ economicus or, or making rational decisions about enriching themselves. The property seizures, I think this is what the book is showing, were clearly a bonus of genocide, but they may indeed be as much an effect than a cause and should not be isolated from the emotional and cognitive constructions of identities what was thought at the time to be morally permissible and understandings of what was in one's interest. Umid does not stop with the genocide. Once the defeat of the Ottomans in October 1918 occurred and occupation of much of the country by the victorious allied powers, Eintop first fell into the hands of the British and a year later was turned over to the French and thousands of Armenians returned to Eintop and the new Ottoman government actually under the sway of the occupiers uh, um, ordered the restitution of their properties. But over time, as many Armenians will tell you to this day, you can't trust the imperialists. British attitudes toward the Muslims shifted from hostility to open friendship and the fortunes of the Armenians, their future completely dependent on the occupation, deteriorated. The precarity of the Christians increased once the British turned the region of Cilicia in the fall of 1919 over to the French, who proved to be treacherous in the eyes of the Armenians. Armenian legionnaires accompanied the French, and Muslims faced with terrifying threat gravitated toward the burgeoning nationalist movement led by Mustafa Kemal, and worked with underground remnants of the Young Turk committees. War eventually broke out between the Turks and the French, and though the French defeated the insurrection, they soon stealthily left the region. And Kurt writes, in the end, the French failed not only to protect the Armenians, but also to allow them the means of protecting themselves. Unquote. Once the Kemalists took over, they renamed the city Gaizi Antep to honor the struggle against the occupation. Rather than heroic resistance, however, Kurt shows that the resistance, quote, seems to have been as much the organized struggle of a group of genocide profiteers seeking to hold onto their loot as it was a fight against an occupying 
force, unquote. So Armenians fled. Their properties were once again confiscated, this time legally, that is by the new republic, which adopted laws sanctioning theft. Kurt shows repeatedly how Kemalism reproduced the practices of the disgraced young Turks. And the process reminds this reader, at least, how states like the United States and Australia, Israel, and others use legislation and the courts to legitimize the transfer of property from the dispossessed to a new settler class. When, when a state or a people wants the land, but not the people on that land, either ethnic cleansing or genocide may occur. I would finish by saying that this is an extraordinarily revealing and even courageous book, the product of prodigious research. Umit names names, gives us details, which houses and lands went to which prominent Muslim families, who were indeed the founding generation of the ethno-national bourgeoisie of the Turkish Republic. And he notes finally that the Kemalist state, quote, pronounced all Armenians without exception to be, quote unquote, harmful people and did not permit them to enter the country, unquote. In their misguided efforts, think about the consequences of this genocide. A misguided effort to modernize their country by the young Turks and the Kemalists. By deploying mass violence, the young Turks and their Kemalist successors in many ways turned time backwards and stunted the progress their peoples might have made. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, uh, while we're waiting for questions, if anybody has any question or comment, uh, you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask it live. Um, you can also uh, put it in the chat and I will read it. And I just want to ask, Umit, is there anything that you want to um, respond to in anything that, that Ron has said while we're waiting for questions? Yeah, uh, no, uh, no, actually, uh, thank you very much for the generous comments uh, of Professor Sunni. And I would like to entertain uh, any question from the Q&A session from the group. And and also, I would like to maybe talk about um, this property list. And I can also show some uh, images uh, as well for our audience, if uh, you know, uh, they want as well. And, and and I would like to talk about the hardships uh, which I went I had gone through over the course of my research process. So these were really enjoyable experiences, uh, and I can I can tell some some stories about uh, about my research process as well. But you know, uh, it's it's just all up to you guys. I'm happy to entertain any kind of question. Yeah. All, all of that would be great. While we're waiting for a question, um, perhaps uh, um, let me just ask you one, just to get us going here. And so recently we've been seeing more publications of micro histories on genocide. And I'm, I used Omar Bartov's Anatomy of a Genocide. Yeah. The life and death of a town called Buchach in my uh, in my genocide class. This came out in 2018, and yours, among others. And I'm just wondering if you might say a few words on what micro histories offer us in the study of mass violence mm -hmm. that maybe some previous um, studies have not asked us. And oh, I just noticed. Sorry, Baki had his hand up, but yeah. I'll come right to you, Baki. <laughs> Oh no no no! Please finish your question. I'll, I'll I'll follow you. No no, there's no rush. Please. So yeah, I was just wondering. Um, I know this is something that that Ron had mentioned also in you know observed, uh, in his comments, and um, 
I was, sorry. I just noticed the chat got distracted there. <laughs> um, and so I was just wondering if you, yeah. what you thought about micro histories now kind of yeah, absolutely. in, in mm -hmm. this, um, yeah new new way of exploring episodes mm -hmm. of mass violence mm -hmm. uh to me uh micro history as a historical as a methodology let's say uh or history as a way of history writing writing history it enables us to see the real concrete actors and set of incidents in 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 the ground level you know so it enables us to dissect dependent and independent arrivals of the our object of inquiry with a more substantial and in a more substantial and concrete manner and it also gives us an important methodological tool to uh, come up with an overriding or all inclusive or exhaustive kind of general uh, argumentation um, because what i have been telling or exploring and examining in the case of Aintab has an, a number of uh, overlapping and similarities and, uh, and, 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 and with the other you know, cities, not only in the region of Cilicia, but also in Western Armenia, Armenia too. But it, uh, it also provides us uh, to see the differences, the nuances between the cases, between the case studies. And, and, and most importantly, to me, uh, micro, uh, 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 micro uh, 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 studies um, it also enable us uh, to see the to see the, the 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 how are generally assumed argumentation or conventional or mainstream arguments or ideas um, have been you know. To what extent are right or accurate or valid for for that region or this region? Uh, in a way, it uh, kind of gives us the, the kind of unintended consequence consequences of of, of the subject matter as well. So, um, but also in the book, I try to use not only micro and micro level, but also the meso level. Uh, to understand and explain uh, the, the the role of uh, middlemen, uh, like not only local actors or gentry or urban notables, but also uh, local governors and uh, the military enterprises, warlords, and 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 uh, so forth. Thank you, Umit. Uh, Baki, and then after Baki, we have a question from chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Umit. Um, I, I actually was basically going to suggest what you um, offered, which is sharing some of the images, because if I remember correctly, uh, the most striking one to me was uh, a, a, a house that used to be owned by an um, uh, Ottoman Armenian, eventually became the Museum of Culture, Turkish Culture. Or something like that in in the town. Uh, that that is the one that I remember most vividly. But actually, please share with us all the images because they're very helpful uh, to, um, you know, it may help us imagine the very dispossession and then looting uh, physically. It, what I very much appreciated your book also included a map that actually showed yeah. you know this house that house in. And we can we can walk through Aintab today and sort of locate these things. And that I thought was very, very, very good. Anyway, yeah, please absolutely. tell us a little bit about these uh buildings. Uh can you can you see the image now? Uh, okay. Yes. So yes. this is the building uh you are referring to, Hojam. Uh Atatürk Cult Atatürk Culture Merkezi, Atatürk Cultural Center. Uh it was the it was this house belonged to Avedis Cebecian. So Avedis Cebajian, uh, who was uh, who was a military officer and also drafted and served in Gallipoli, and then after Gallipoli he was in uh, Eastern Anatolia as well. He was in Bitlis. He was in Diyarbakir, and he also wrote his memoir. and His memoir was published in Armenian first and then Turkish by Aras Publishing House. 
And is, um, very sorry, is there any notice of this in the building for a current visitor of the building? Is there anywhere any acknowledgement of this? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, it's uh, in the book. I'm also explaining uh, in 2005, uh, Antep governorship, uh, uh, like um, so, Antep governorship issued published a book about the the, the city and promoting the city for the for tourists and so 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 on. And this building uh, was also included in this booklet, and in the and it was uh, it it was considered as one of the most valuable and important items of the Gaziantep Culture Inventory, Gaziantep Cultural uh, Record or an an inventory, whatever in inventory. And but it didn't mention um, any kind of historical information uh, about its its Armenian past and 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 whatsoever. Unfortunately, and this uh, Gaziantep Democrat Party, and uh, this uh, that was a uh, that was a Han Inn, also which was owned by uh, uh, Nazar Nazarian, Kara Nazar A, uh, who was the one of the most prominent prominent and wealthy Armenian families, and they were uh, they were also deported, but since. Karanazar uh, had a good and cordial relations with uh, Aleppo Governor Jalal Bey. Aleppo uh, Jalal Bey um, managed to provide a certificate for them to be escorted by two Kurdish security guards. So they ended up in Aleppo safe and sound. And so these, these were the usual suspects, <laughs> let's say. So it's the photo of a uh, local Muslim uh, civilian and military elites of Aintab when Ali Jenani Bey, who was now will hold his, his stick, uh, who was the president or head of the CUP club in the city. And he was a member of the Union and Progress Party uh, and a longtime member. And he became the first minister of commerce in, in, in Ankara government. So that photo was taken uh, in 1924 when he pays uh, a city a visit. And he was greeted by these, uh, basically the, per the former perpetrators, let's say. And let me, yes, this guy, uh, so Mahmoud Dai Bey, I went to high school to his great, great children, uh, Dai. And Burju Dai, who he, she was a friend of mine, so she she was uh, related to Mahmoud Dai. Bey. Mahmoud Dai uh, was employ was the employee of uh, Karanazar A. He worked for him, and his uh, some uh, and, and 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 keys of uh, Karanazar A's uh, shops, inns, and soap uh, fabrics for uh, uh, manufacturers, for instance, the keys were in, entrusted to him. And then he ended up in title deeds office and he acquired, obtained all title deeds owned by Karanazar A and then obtained them uh, on his behalf. And Mahmoud Dai, uh, he was one of the founding fathers of the primitive accumulation of actually Aintab and also one of the first entrepreneurs generously and religiously supported by Mustafa Kemal because he was given properties and estates by Milli Emlak, by National Estate Agency. He was he participated in auctions, but he was favored in the auctions. They already knew the result and he was going to win the auctions. So he acquired numerous properties at ridiculous prices as a result of these auctions because he was politically uh, and, and, uh, very strong. And he was again uh, the first president of Gaziantep uh, commercial uh, uh, office or center, let's say. Um, Umit, uh, I cannot help but do a running commentary here because the story you just told, separately from Armenian genocide, just reminded me of the um, fact, I guess, that you disclose here that. Uh, doing corrupt auctions yeah. uh, has a longer history uh, than we care to admit in Turkey today. 
usually, I mean, these kind of auctions are happening every day in Turkey today, and we always think of it as an AKP introduced business. But so you're showing us that it was happening already in the Republican Kemalist era. That is uh, also important to underline. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to no, uh, no, break it, but I, I, I wanted to just... This is a fascinating that. point, Hojan, because it's so... Uh, I, it's 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 so contemporary now what we are talking about still valid because during the AKP government uh, the, the term of office of the AKP or Erdogan uh, the the auction uh, law has been changed more than eighty two times legislated in the parliament and uh, so it, irony of history I don't know so and this is uh, Karanazar A and his family his immediate family. His son uh, on the left, Nigogos, and right, uh, Haruchun, and, and the Garabet, the little son, Garabet Nazarian. So the Kara Nazara, he was the honorary consul of America. So that's why he was kind of also, uh, he carved out important and, co and, and intimate relations with the uh, Jalal Bey. So he was, a, he was also politically and, and culturally and economically strong guy and, and prominent guy and and his wife uh hanum also my mother name is hanum too so it's hanum hanum it's the same and so this is the the fantastic and the uh, and, and remarkable uh Eintab gregorian the first Eintab gregorian orthodox church surf as was it's a Neri church and unfortunately as it during the earthquakes one of the facade of the church has been greatly damaged, by the way, because not, not because of the fact that it was not a solid, you know, building, but because of the restoration attempts, you know, the building has been damaged during the earthquakes. And I want to show you also, uh, this is the interior of the church, Hojam. This church has been turned into a military garrison and military uh, a military uh, prison in early Turkish Republic. <laughs> and in 60s and 70s, both leftists and the rightists, revolutionaries and the rightists, uh, they they were put in this prison in this church. The, 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 the church was a prison. And after uh, the 1982 coup d'état, Kenan Evren decided to uh, turn it into a mosque. He did it not only for the Armenian church here. He did it. Uh, he did the same thing for uh, for many cities in uh, in Anatolia uh, after 1982. I don't know why he kind of improved such a you know particular interest in those buildings. Kenan Evren, and um, and also I would like to show you the the property list. Uh, you, um, let me interrupt just for a yeah, second so that please. we can, uh, before we run out of time, uh, we do have uh, somebody who's asking to hear a little more about your research process and also if you plan to publish your book in Turkish as well. Yeah. Uh, let me start with the second question. Yeah, yeah, the book will be out in Turkish next year, hopefully. It's now at the hands of translator. Uh, and it, it will be published by Aras Publishing House. And I would like to thank them here for their being courageous and, and audacious to publish this book because my own publisher, actually, Iletishim, was not willing to publish it, even though it was my own publisher. Because in, 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 uh, in the past few years, I published my books in Turkish with Iletishim. But for this one, uh, I think it has to do with the grim and bleak political situation in Turkey. So that's why I really uh, owe a lot to Aras and I would like to acknowledge that here as well. So the Aras uh, is going to publish it. And so I, 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 got, uh, I can tell a lot of stories about the research, my archival research process, but um, uh, let me tell you just, just one story and... Um, and 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 make it really uh really short um <clears throat> i faced with local administrative hurdles and 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 and, and haka yavuz <laughs> professor in the utah university of utah uh so it's, he sent me a few slander emails because of the nature and content of my work i was was doing and he sent letters to allegedly 
the Gaziantep governorship and ask it to ban me from entering local archives and libraries in the city. And, and late Hasan Jalal Güzel, former minister of education, youth and sport and politician, you know, he was one of the uh, advisors of Turgut Özal as well. So he was a native of Gaziantep. He also initiated a smear campaign. So he passed away, by the way, against me and exerted strenuous efforts to prevent me from doing my research in the city. So I wasn't able to get into local libraries in the city, even though I'm, I'm, I was residential, I was born there. And so since my research and later the book proved and documented that his family members, Hasan Jalal Güzel family members, particularly his maternal grandfather became affluent and constitute new bourgeois or the elite class of the city in the Republican period by seizing the properties and especially the lands of Armenians, vineyards and the pistachio lands especially, he made those kind of attempts to, uh, to impede me. And so another relevant story, it's of, of uh, it has to do with the discovery. Uh, while doing my archival research for the book, a fantastic incident happened to me over the course of my research, I was searching for the report and records of Abandoned Property Liquidation Commissions and its Eintop branch, Eintop Abandoned Property Liquidation Commission. So these commissions were founded by Ottoman ruling government and in charge of liquidating and selling Armenian mobile and immobile properties in public auctions after their forced deportation during the genocide period. The government kept entire records of these sales and other transactions of these commissions. Over the course of one and a half years research in Ottoman archives in Istanbul, I could not manage to obtain records of these commissions, including Eintop branch, as they were kept hidden and inaccessible for researchers. And as a matter of fact, these records were essential for my book in order to document the so-called legal theft and plunder and liquidation of Armenian wealth in a local place. I felt really desperate back then. In the meantime, I paid a visit to LA to meet a friend of mine who was a descendant of genocide survivor, Pakrat Kazazian, late Pakrat Kazazian from Aintab in 2015. So Uncle Pakrat was rather supportive of my work since we had met. He wanted to introduce me his cousin whose grandfather, Sarkis Yakupian, from Aintab and survived the genocide by ending up, up in Aleppo, opening a bakery over there. Uncle Pakrat took me to her house. It was a quite warm, welcoming, after a little of night chats and having delicious food, Pakrat's cousin, she brought dozens of old papers, documents, all written in Ottoman Turkish and put them in front of me. She was basically trying to help me and thought that there might have some documents which could be useful for my work. So the documents and papers were not organized. I started to look at them. While getting lost among them, all of a sudden my hand went to old papers and I start to cast a gaze on them. The more I look at and read them, the more I got thrilled. Having read the first page, I realized a report of Eintop Liquidation Commission was standing in front of me and I was reading auction results regarding the mobile properties, assets and goods of her great grandfather, Sarkis Yakupian. Because what the documents were telling was so groundbreaking because what I found was really crux of the matter and proved and documented what an institution known as Eintop Property Commission, a state institution, official state institution did to the wealth and properties of a deported Armenian. It blatantly showed and proved uh, the plunder and spoliation under the veil of legality as Professor Sunni has just pointed out. So that's why it's the first of its kind, such a document has been revealed and manifested in the book. And, and the Ottoman archives, I'm talking about Hojam, only the property transaction of one person. We are talking about at least one, 1 million Armenians who were deported, let's say. So we are talking about millions of uh, auction results. And, and I wanna, uh, if you want, I can show you this list just briefly. Um, <clears throat> let me share my screen. Here we go. Yes, this is liquidated mobile goods and assets owned by Sarkis Yakupian. And you see the items, most of them were from the kitchen. And you will see the buyer and the price uh, of the property or mobile property in question. So it includes 
yogurt container, nargile head, basin, fess, plate. And you see most of the buyers were members of the Eintop CUP club. Uh, and, and other valuable items which were kept in uh, Ottoman bank. The gold bracelet, gold watch band, golden rings, uh, and, and, and other mobile assets. And th this is the map uh, Baki Hoca uh, has been talking about. I was able to pinpoint and locate uh, 456 places, locations, uh, but uh, be because of the pagination limits, uh, my editor only allow me to to publish 40, uh, 45 of them. So that indicates the trajectory and the record of the, the, the history of the properties in question uh, on, on an Armenian map, which property went to who, from who to who, and the whole historical trajectory, whole historical record from uh, 1915, all the way leading up to present time. This is what I uh, try to do in, in the book. Uh, by relying on Armenian sources, and not only Armenian sources, also uh, Ottoman sources, uh, especially British and French archival sources, and also uh, oral history. I talked to uh, elderly people in, in Ainta who heard some kind of stories about the histories of these locations, and I tried to glean some information from them too. And yeah, these... Uh, that was that was another uh, another uh, record. Um. Thank you so much for those. Um, are there? Uh, let me see. We have Baki and um, let's Ilbe Özdemirci. Would you like to? ask a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for this beautiful meeting. Uh, I'm joining this meeting from Kilis, which is very close to Gaziantep, very small town, uh, nearly 50 kilometers far away from Gaziantep. And since 2011, I am living in this city and this region. Uh, as an academician who lives in this re region, I have always thought that uh, Gaziantep is uh, de facto and symbolically border of Turkey. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Uh, Kurt, uh, you mentioned, uh, I think this picture uh, cannot be built without the approval and effort of uh, local major majority. Uh, from this point of view, how do you interpret the everyday life in the city of Aintep from the perspective of ordinary people uh, before 1915 in terms of the forms of uh, relations between the Muslim and Armenian communities? Thank you very much again. Thank you. It's a very important question. Um, <clears throat> actually, before the publication of the book in English, uh, I had I had published a couple of articles and and one monograph on perpetrators. And in all these publications, I kind of talk about the, the violent, performative violence, how violence was carried out, who were the main actors, what prompted them to, you know commit this violence against their former neighbors uh, and, and, and et cetera. And over the course of this, I mean, the publication of uh, these, uh, these, these articles or, or book, uh, I, could, uh, pay, I could visit the hometown, I could visit the city, I could visit, for instance, um, Papyrus Cafe, this Garan, uh, Garanazar house, I was comfortable. The guy, the owner knew what I was doing. You know, I was kind of harmless in his eyes because I was only talking about, you know, the violent and, and, and these kind of aspects. But once I start uh, talking about and writing about the property, and then I became the persona non grata. And he, in, 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 in uh, last year, in September, I was there and I wasn't welcome in the coffee shop he really really gave me gave me a very um, you know harrowing look i i understood i what i am i i wasn't wanted here because uh when the book was out 
I was stupid enough to give, to give a couple of interviews in Turkish about the book. And, and also one of his daughters live in Houston. So she heard that the book was out in English and she kind of read the book and she sent me a very, uh, you know, uh, very bad, very lousy, bad letter. And, and telling me, we bought this house, we purchased it. My grandfather purchased it. We had the title. This is all accurate. I'm not telling you, you kind of stole it, but this property has a has another history, you know? And, and that had related to with your great grandfather because there was the process, the way in which this property was owned by your great grandfather. So uh, I think that uh, people in the city now, if the issue is about property, if the issue is about, because you are touching upon the real people, their individual properties, that, that gives them a kind of trepidation. They, got, they get worried about. They still firmly believe that someone will come up and then get these properties back or claim about it. And that's why that's the real uh, so, source, of, source of the inner source of their fears. Otherwise, until that point, I hadn't had any kind of issue with, lo with the people, with local people in the city. Yeah. And in our main neighborhood, especially, people know the whole story. They know the Armenian past and, and, and Armenian history of uh, these houses, uh, which uh, the most of them have been turned, transformed into boutique hotels, co coffee shops. And now uh, some, you know, rent, uh, some houses are main old Armenian houses, which are not in good shape. Syrian refugees are occupying these places. This is another, you know, connected story. And 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 this uh, this abundant abundant properties now become so-called home for another refugee people, you know, Syrian refugees now. And so otherwise, this is a no non non story, and 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 the um, people just uh, acknowledge it, acknowledge it in private conversations, but in public of course they don't want to talk about it they are not in, in denial i wouldn't say that they are in denial but they just want to they don't want to talk about it they don't want to raise the issue you know because they they know the reality uh in papyrus cafe for instance uh let me show you this is papyrus cafe one of the have you ever visited papyrus cafe Il, il yes, sir. yes, several yeah. times. Yes, yeah, sir. you see, this is the, the owner of the house. The, the his photo is still standing inside of the house. Yeah, exactly. They, yes, they haven't taken it taken it down. <laughs> Incredible. Um, thank, you, thank, you. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. There's another uh, question. Uh, there's a growing literature on racial capitalism particularly in the context of North America and Europe. If we theorize Turkish capitalism as racial, how would you bring together the religion and uh, ethnicity in an analysis of racism? Uh, as Professor Sunni uh, has depicted in his comments, uh, I also uh, describe it as ethno-national bourgeoisie. And because uh, in in my case, uh, ethnicity, religion, uh, racism, to a very very little extent, I wouldn't say racism was all around all over the pay all over the map in in this case. Uh, there were some particular incidents, some particular discourses, uh, but uh, race, racism or uh, racist tone of ethno-nationalist uh, ethno-nationalism in this period uh, was not prevalent, or uh, I would say. But <clears throat> this ethnic fraternity or ethnic nationalism, sorry, uh, came out of uh, expropriation. In my case, so I am trying to show how ethnic nationalism became substantial and concrete through expropriation. And uh, so 
racial aspect of Turkish capitalism? It's 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 an interesting question. I never ponder about that. I never thought about that. But ethnicity, uh, ethnicity, ethnicity, Turkish nationalism or Turkish ethnic nationalism in this period uh, cannot be uh, separated or considered separately from the religious aspect. It was always there. Religion uh, as one of the defining parameters of this nationalism, but Turkification or ethnicity or et ethno ethno basis of this nationalism was much more vocal than the religious aspect but religious aspect uh, can be seen uh, more blatantly in the discourse of uh, jihad i think this issue has been quite understudied to date uh, the role of jihad in not only in armenian genocide but also in the destruction of assyrian people especially in 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 the region of Mardin or uh, is or other southeastern pro eastern provinces uh the role of jihad is quite essential in the destruction of Assyrian people uh so uh this this, this aspect uh record backs for uh, more exploration and new research uh to me actually but in my case religion nationalism and ethno nationalism ethnic nationalism religion was always there Religious discourse was always there. Thanks so much, Imit, and thank you for the question. Yeah, yeah, important question. Thank you. Um, are there any last questions? Any last questions? If not, um, Baki, go ahead. Oh, um, Umit, uh, I remember you mentioning uh, a little gl glimpse of your next project. Uh, it, it, I think that grew out of a detail from this book. Uh, do, do, do you mind sharing that a bit? Uh, it, sure. You don't have to give too many details, but you can maybe share the same. Uh, I because it was a, a striking story. It was a, yes. It, it, yeah. one of the perpetrators actually i'm not going to say it so why don't you tell the story <laughs> now the the next project uh is about a um, uh, um, biography of a, a genocide technocrat which i define him as a genocide technocrat uh the biography of mustafa reshat mimaroğlu uh who was the uh who carried out 24th of april 1915 uh, mass arrest in istanbul he worked uh, for the second division of Minister of Interior under the jurisdiction of Talat Pasha. He served as a police director in the second division and taking charge of following the activities of domestic enemies, uh, quote unquote, which refer to uh, Christian minorities, uh, actually. So he, uh, he executed one by one uh, arrest of Armenian intellectuals based in Istanbul. He followed them since September 1914. He prepared their files, and one of the intellectuals he arrested was was his professor from Mülkiye, actually Imperial School of Political Science, Diran Kelekyan, and he had cordial relations with Diran Kelekyan. Diran Kelekyan did teach him Armenian, so Mustafa Reshad was fluent in Armenian, just like Esat Uras. Esat Uras and Mustafa Reshat were colleagues. They work in the same department. And Reshat became uh, the head of uh, head of state court, head of Danishtai, uh, one of the Supreme Courts uh, in 1932. So he was trusted by Mustafa Kemal as well. So he reached out to the high echelons of state bureaucracy in 1930s and then he got retired, became MP for Izmir for one term. And then after, uh, after his term, he became a member of board of Agricultural Bank. And then he became the head of the uh, Republican People's Party's Istanbul administration. And so I'm writing <clears throat> biography of this, this, this persona, this, this person, and and on his biography, on his deeds, uh, I uh, try to portray uh, 
how uh, bureaucratic mechanisms, administrative mechanisms uh, enable political decision makers to carry that deportation and other genocidal policies. I'm looking at the pencil, uh, pencil pushers, not the violent guys or the, or the perpetrators who, uh, who got their hands dirty by blood. I'm rather uh, than looking at, I'm uh, rather than focusing on that, I'm uh, looking at uh, this techno bureaucrat guys. And also uh, I aim to show the continuity between the CUP, especially uh, per, in, in terms of the rank and file of the CUP and the Republican and the Turkish Republic by focusing on this middle and low level uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, stuff. Uh, that sounds exciting is another uh, sort of step in showing that this issue was not a matter of uh, one central committee making a decision and all of the responsibility lying with them but it's shared exactly. by many people not exactly. only in localities but also in the in bureaucracy hierarchy. so that's yeah, in that yeah. sense it's it's very yeah. very impressive and i must say i'm personally interested in the little detail you just shared i don't work on late ottoman history uh, but um, I was once involved in a potential project about the memory of the um, the conquest of Constantinople uh, and when it started to be, um, you know, memorialized. Uh, when did we start celebrating it in Turkey? And and I, my research into it uh, uncovered that it was actually Diran Kelekya who first uh, wrote. Uh, about you know the importance of this conquest yes. in 1913, and I shared it um, in Toplum uh, Tarih. Yeah, I read your I, piece. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually have a, had a follow up just as last um, uh, in this month's issue, uh, the a second piece that he wrote in. So he, the first piece he wrote in 1913, the second one is 1914. 14, yeah. And of course, he couldn't write one in 1915 because at that time, this man who who felt so patriotic about Ottomans that he wanted to memorialize the conquest of Constantinople. It was, he was one of the first people who to do this and we might actually discuss what that means, but I'm Absolutely, not, yeah. gonna get into it. This man ended up uh, being killed in the genocide. And while I was providing a little bit of information about that episode, how he was, murdered there were many many different stories exactly yes yes uh, so so the, the, i'm wondering whether you're you might be able to pinpoint which one ac actually really is true but of course you're saying you, this guy only was the one who arrested him arrested him so we, uh, we probably I, don't know which one of the stories is true about the end of him according to armenian sources hojam he was killed in chorum uh so yeah. that story, yeah, Raymond Kevorkian uh, has a, has also has also written about Rankelekian, very few sentences, and I and also uh, according to Aram Andonian, that was the story. So I that's why I rely on Andonian and Kevorkian in this sense. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. I I'll be looking forward to this. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so so you much. Pleasure. Uh, we do have one more question from chat. Um, uh, no, we are not. I, I see what she means. No, uh, we are we are talking about two different Mimarolos. This okay. Mimaro, yeah. And he has nothing to do with uh, uh, Ilham Mimarolo, by the way. So, so um, any last questions? This has been a fascinating discussion. Um, Thank you. And Thank you for your presentation, Umit. And thank you so much, Ron, for uh, your very thoughtful comments. And I'll thank turn it back to Baki. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet, for moderating the session. Thank you, Umit, for your presentation. Thank yeah. you, Ron, for your comments. And of course, Umit, thank you again for writing this book. Um, I mean, I, I cannot imagine how much courage it would require. Uh, the, 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 I mean, you already mentioned how the, the reactions have uh, started. And once the Turkish publication actually gets out, uh, it will be difficult for you to, to 
visits home your hometown probably it, 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 yeah. so it, it's it's I, I admire your courage uh, and and I look forward to uh, reading your next book about uh, this man who um, arrested his own professor Thank you so much for all of you and for organizer, Professor Suni and Professor Klein and our uh, participants. I appreciate that. Thank you for your time and for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, uh, I, you will be receiving an email about the YouTube uh, link to the video of this uh, uh, session. And then you will also receive later an email about our next programming in June. Uh, one of the events we have in June is going to be on Nazim Hikmet. Uh, so I uh, strongly encourage you to consider watching us again. Have a wonderful week. Take good care. Bye-bye.